everybody, and welcome to Gen Friends. I'm your host, Sherry Hudson Passy from Carolina Girl Genealogy. And you know, I have the best panel every episode, and I am so grateful for these people who show up <laughs> and come and, and talk. We have Bernice Bennett with us tonight. Hi, Bernice. Hello. Hi. And Bernice's website is Jeannie B. Roots. So right. go visit her there. We've got Laura Hedgecock from Treasure Everybody. of Memories. Hi, Laura. Hi. Good to have you here. We've got Melissa Barker, the archive lady, and your website is a genealogist in the archives. Yep, that's me. Hello. Glad to be here. Glad to have Carol with us. Yeah, glad. Yeah, and we'll get to Carol in just a second. I'm <laughs> so glad she's here. But last, we've got Dan Earl. Hey, Dan. Hey, how's it the going? Family history guy. <laughs> Glad you're all here. And we have a very special guest. We've got Carol Petranik. And Carol is a Greek genealogy expert. And your website is Spartan Roots, right? That's correct, yes. Uh, well, we're so excited to have you here because I, I don't have any Greek. Does anybody on the panel have any Greek? So this is like Dan if was saying. Did, it's, we like, would know each other by now. <laughs> it's all Greek to me, according to Mr. Earl. That's <laughs> so, right. So let's start out with, you've got a big project that you've been working on. Can you tell us about that? Sure, I'd be more than happy to. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. This is just great fun. Um, so we, have, we have a community that is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, five years ago, we had a Facebook group, Hellenic Genealogy Geek, kind of like computer geek, not Greek, but geek. We had 2,000 people on that page and we thought we were rocking and rolling. Wow. In the last five years, we now have like 25,600 people on that page. My goodness. Amazing. I am one of the moderators and I am telling you, my every day my in-depth box is filled with 8, 10, 12, 15 requests of people to join. Um, it just seems to be the time for people who have some Greek in their ancestry whether it's um, a grandparent or great-grandparent if they're younger, um, or uh, perhaps they um, had married somebody who may have a little Greek in them. Uh, sometimes we find that people who are just part Greek, in other words, my family, my mom and dad are both Greek from neighboring villages in Sparta, and so all my grandparents are, are from Sparta as well. And um, so I am like 100% Greek. Even my DNA is 97% Greek. Oh, so. wow. <laughs> but we are, we are the rare breed because the longer that, that um, uh, people are uh, in either the US or Canada or Australia or some other country outside of Greece, the greater the chance that they're, uh, either they have intermarried with someone who is not Greek or perhaps a parent or grandparent. Oh, had intermarried. Sure. So what we find is that people research all the easy lines on their family and then they get to that one Greek line and they're <laughs> like, uh, I don't know what to do here or there's no resources, which there really are very few. And so they, they shy away from that. But now that, now that people are seeing that there is a group that's been organized, that's very, very active um, and very willing to help each other. We have people who actually research for people on this Facebook page. Oh, wow. um, so they're feeling like they can get some support and they certainly can. So the project that we're working on right now with my colleague Gregory Contos over in Patras, which is a city um, in the Peloponnese uh, area of Greece, is uh, to, we now have going a website called GreekAncestry.net. Uh, and this is the first, this has only been launched um, in February of this year. It brand is new. The, brand new, brand new. so great. It is the first website that is, that hosts images from Greece that are searchable and name indexed. So what Greg does is he has a team of indexers who can read these old Greek records. And trust me, they are not easy to read. In fact, a lot of people who are native Greeks cannot read the old oh, Greek handwriting oh from the 1800s. So he has a team of people and we are going out. I go out uh, in the summers 
and we um, we get original content, and then his team will name index these records, mm. and then they're going up on his site. So um, I have been going every year for the last five years. In fact, this is the first summer I'm not going to go due to the COVID. Uh, the country itself is safe, but getting there mm. is not. <laughs> so this year I have to stay U.S. bound. Yeah. Um, which is very sad for me, but the work will be there next year. So I will continue next year. But what I'm doing is um, going and getting original records from the metropolis, which is like an archdiocese. It's akin to an archdiocese. So you okay. have, there are 81 metropolises in Greece. So underneath them are the, the smaller um, uh, geographically churches. Mm -hmm. So um, my metropolis is Sparta and I had gone there the first time in 2014 with Greg to do some research on my family. Saw the condition of the books and uh, thought to myself, oh this is not good. Has anybody, anybody ever thought about trying to preserve these? And uh, went back the next year and uh, back to the metropolis and we're, we were having a conversation with one of the priests there and I, my Greek is really bad. And I said to Gregory, ask the priests if they've ever thought about digitizing and preserving their records. And he did. And, and the priest said that they thought they had a contract with the European Union, but it had fallen through. And uh, I said, oh my gosh, well, ask him if he wants them digitized. And they said, yes, we would love to. Send us a proposal and we'll take it to the bishop. Wow. So we walked out of there and I said to Greg, Greg, we're going to get these records. We're talking marriage records from 1835 to 1935. Oh. I said, Greg, we're going to come back next year. We're going to get these records. And he said, how's that going to happen? There's just, I mean, he's, he, he, he just couldn't even conceive of it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you have to understand that I'm, I'm a genealogist. I know people in the U.S., We'll find a way to make this yes, happen. you know people. <laughs> yeah. So fortunately, I made some calls and did a lot of the rounds at Roots Tech that year. And we were able to, um, Galad at um, MyHeritage was very interested in, in getting these records. So consequently, um, I went back to Greece in 2016. And to the metropolis. And what, and what a hardship to have to keep going back to Greece. Isn't that just really and sad? All summer long, yes. <laughs> but anyway, I went back in 2016, and Greg and I did the marriage index books. So these are the just the typical index books that you would find in any church. Mm -hmm. The name of the bride, the name of the groom, um, perhaps the parents' names, the names of the, the best man, um, etc. The name of the church, and that's it. So we had a great time doing that. And while we were there for that week, we learned that in the basement of the metropolis were all the documents that support those marriages. Oh. Meaning that we had letters from the village priest to the bishop oh. at the metropolis stating that this man and this woman want to get married. I know this family. I know they're not related within um, four generations. Uh, <laughs> I know this, I know that. Um, and wow. so the bishop would write back and say, yes, you have my permission, or uh, I see that there may be a problem here. We need more information. Anyway, make a long story short, in the basin of the metropolis, our downstairs is the storage. And when Greg and I went down and we saw box after box after box after box of documents, wow. I said, we have to get these documents because that's where the genealogical information is. So we worked our magic and um, went back in 2017, uh, excuse me, in 2018. And um, that's when I was there for two months. I worked from about 8.30 to 5.30 every day with like a 10 minute break for lunch. Wow. Everybody thought I was nuts, but I, I digitized over 210,000 documents. So oh my gosh, that's so, where that's did you a, get the, where did you get the equipment to do it? Okay. So gratefully, because these projects um, were for my heritage, I went over as a volunteer. I said, I don't want any money. I don't want you to give me anything. I just want to go do this as a volunteer because this is my area. These are where my family's from. 
and I didn't want money to have anything to do with this. So, but they did provide a camera for us and lights. So they provided the equipment and I went and did the work. Um, it, uh, we are now really excited to announce that sometime within the next month, all these records will be online at my heritage. Oh, okay. Thank goodness. Wow. We've been, we've been waiting. When I say all these records, what I mean is not only the church books, the index books, but all those documents that I digitize that support those marriages. So if you have, if you find John Smith married Mary Doe in 1876, and you find that record on my heritage and you click on it, not only will you see the uh, record in the book, the index book, but all the documents supporting that are going to come up as well. Oh my gosh. So this is really, this is really monumental. Oh it's just, goodness. just amazing. And we're so grateful to my heritage for their support there. Um, while I was there, uh, because this is my area of a personal interest, we asked my heritage if they would be interested in getting the village church books. So remember the metropolis is the larger jurisdiction. And then underneath that are many, many villages, 142 villages. And each village has at least one church. Some of them have three or four or five, these tiny little villages. And um, we negotiated another contract that the bishop signed. So all of the village church books were done last year in 2019. Goodness. I went back and did those last what year. What a boon for great genealogists. Well, oh anybody gosh. from Sparta is going yeah. to be a very happy camper. They'll yeah. be doing lots of happy dances, Sherry. <laughs> um, and not only that, but while I was working on those, Greg and his indexing team have been working on other records that my heritage will be publishing within the next month as well. Um, the area of Corfu, which is an island um, north uh, very close to the, the border of Italy. Uh, there will be all the municipal records from there. All of the voting list for every area in Greece from the late 1800s will be online at MyHeritage as well. Now these are projects that MyHeritage has sponsored. So we are going to have a very nice collection there on MyHeritage. And we're, we just are so appreciative of Galad's interest in Greece and his desire to make records available wow. to people who are researching from that area. Um, in the meantime, we recognize that there are many records that we could attain that maybe might not be large enough or maybe too specific and not general enough to be of interest to my heritage. So Greg and I did a lot of talking and he decided that he was going to go ahead and start a business, his own professional business in Greece. Um, he has been the Greek record specialist for my heritage for the last four years and he is continuing on with them as a consultant, but he's now started his own website, this Greek, Greek ancestry.net. And there is where we are going to put just whatever we can get. Um, additional church records. We're looking into getting um, records from uh, additional voter lists, city directories, municipal records. So That's some of these may be of interest to my heritage because they may be broad and general enough mm -hmm. uh, for their audience. But if they're not, that's fine. They're going on Greg's uh, site at GreekAncestry.net. So, so cool. Well, Bernice, that is what Bernice we're doing. put a question in the chat room. She wants to ask you a question. Oh, or sure. Two. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, no, it's no, 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 no. So oh, you notify the good and community. Thrilled and thrilled by well, you can exactly. she can ask you the question. You don't have to read. She'll oh, answer. sorry. Okay. Yes, well, just, I just want to know how will you notify the Greek community that these records have been digitized. We uh, will do it all through social media. Um, we have been having a series of conferences. In fact, um, uh, there were three conferences this year that unfortunately had to be canceled. So whatever comes up in the new norm that we have now for conferences, people, once things kind of settle down, people are going to realize that we really do want to do this. We just need to do it in a different format. So it will all be done through um, social media, our Facebook page, the 
contacts that um, Greg has are contacts in the community throughout the US. And what we find is that when people pick up on something, they are the ones that spread the word in their mm. community. So um, we will we will definitely take it take advantage that as much as we can. Um, and then I see also see a question about records on Family Search or Ancestry. Uh, no, Family Search does have records from Greece. They were attained back in the 1980s when. Um, they had a gentleman over in Athens who went to some of the municipal archives and digitized some records. They have a fabulous collection, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of microfilm. However, um, they cannot get permission for those microfilm, which are now in digital format. They are accessible at family history centers, but they are not accessible on the general website at Family Search. So consequently, um, in order to access them, you have to go to a family search center or an affiliate library. Those you know, Carol, Carol, that's a really good point because there's a lot of people that don't understand that and they think for some reason that family search is, you know, keeping those records for some reason and, and only letting people see them. And so it's important for people to know that it's, it's a contract thing. It's totally a contract thing. And um, I spent some time with David Wrencher and a couple of his associates at Roots Tech this past February. And we talked about this incredible collection that they have. And our desire, when I say our, I mean myself and Gregory, our desire to, since we have the team, to get those records name indexed and up sure. on family search at no cost, at no cost. We weren't going to charge to do it. We just wanted to do it. Right. to make it accessible and the attorneys looked at the contracts and they said no can do hmm. just cannot do it because the contract specifically states that they are not accessible to any third parties so unfortunately there is a, and i'm hoping that somehow we'll be able to work through the red tape and maybe make some contacts and see what we can do to get those records if they are if they're not going to be accessible on the world wide web okay i get it but my gosh, let's get them name indexed really so people stupid. can find them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh um, and as far as Ancestry.com, no, there's nothing on there and I don't see anything going there um, in the foreseeable future. So Carol, how extensive are the marriage records? Would you see the parents' names as well as the bride and groom and witnesses? Yes, um, in the index books, you have the way Greek records are written is you would have the man's name and his middle name is his father's name. So immediately you can go back one generation and understand that if it's if it's John James Smith, I'll just I'll keep it easy. <laughs> I won't give you the Greek names. <laughs> if it's John James Smith, then you know that James is is John's father, and so you have the name of his father. Oh, uh, that's for the, nice. <laughs> my yeah. ancestors have done that. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, right? <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful naming tradition. For the woman, she also has her father's name until she's married, and then her, we're using middle name in quotes, then her middle name becomes her husband's name. So if her name is Mary, and her father's name was John Smith, then on the marriage record, she would show up as Mary John Smith. So oh. you would know that Mary's father's name is John. And then you can place them and place them in that family. That makes it really, really easy and very, very nice. Oh, so the naming traditions follow. Um, there is a very specific pattern mm -hmm. to how it's done. The first male child in a family is named after the father's father. The first female is named after the father's mother. So if you have a record that shows the children age-wise, mm -hmm. you know immediately who the uh, grandparents are. The huh. second male is named after the mother's father, and then the second female is named after the mother's mother. And that has been an ironclad rule since time immemorial. So it is easy to find, to go back one more generation as soon as you get those Isn't names. it interesting that so many um, that's that's a lot of tradition from a lot of different countries they use that you know uh, it sounds to me like the greek maybe have carried it further where i know that i mean you see that in irish genealogy or scottish genealogy or, or whatever but it, 
it's not an ironclad rule. It's just mm -hmm. a theory that <laughs> they may have done this, so it can give you a clue. But it sounds to me like in Greek families, that was the rule, and that's what they do. Is that still what they do today, or are they more... Well, I'll name of what I want to. <laughs> yeah, it depends on if many, so many marriages today are marriages between people who are Greek and not non-Greek. Oh, so consequently, yeah. right. it depends on what the couple chooses to do. Mm -hmm. But over in Greece itself, oh yeah, that's how it's done. All right. <laughs> There's no deviation. Laura, you have a question? No, you just ask it. I was going to oh. ask the same thing about was it, was it still happening today? <laughs> Sorry. I have a question. <laughs> sure. Um, okay, well, uh, first, I want to say, as a, from an archivist and a genealogist, thank you so much for doing all those records. Um, you know, um, I have, you know, I've seen basements and attics and stuff full of records, and I was, mm -hmm. wish I could, you know, do something with them. So thank you for that. Uh, the f other thing is that you mentioned when you first started talking that um, that uh, the records and resources are hard to come by for Greek research. Mm -hmm. um, but then you talked about all these records that you, in Sparta, that you digitized. So what is, what's the reasoning for the sparseness or for the hard to get records? Well, first of all, there is no, there are no digital records except on what is now known as the, um, the General State Archives of Greece website. Um, a few years ago, there were some efforts made to begin a digitization project. It was 80% funded by the EU and 20% funded by Greece. And the municipal archives uh, for, this, for the country of Greece, excuse me, not the municipal archives, the state archives, would decide what records they wanted to digitize and put online. Uh, the website is huge. There's a lot of records on there, but most of them are not genealogy related. They're historical documents, they're um, demographic information, they're government documents, but they're not necessarily um, documents that would help a genealogist research their family. Um, so consequently, in our day and age, when people say that there are records accessible, the first thing they think about is, oh, there's a website where I can go. And in Greece, there is, is not. Yes, there's a general state archive re website, but, but because everything is in Greek, anything that's, nothing is name indexed at all. You have to wade, you have to know what you're looking for, figure out how to get to it, and then wade through layer wow. after layer after layer until you get to a specific village that you may be interested in, if there's anything online for that village, then you have to figure out what documents are there for that village. Then you have to read them, <laughs> the old Greek handwriting. So that's pretty daunting in itself. Um, the reason that Greek records are so difficult is because they're not accessible. You have to go to the country itself and do your research on site. So that was going to be my next question was if someone was doing Greek research, how easy or hard or what kind of, what would you have to go through if you lived in the United States to access or talk to an archive or a repository in uh, Greece that the records are not online, but you're trying to do your genealogy research. Could you do that from here? Or like you said, you would have to go there. Well, I have had some success. This is how I started many years ago, is writing a letter to the municipal archive office and requesting, giving whatever information I knew about my family and requesting a look up in what records they had there. Um, I had done that. And in fact, on the Family Search Wiki under Greece, there is a book called um, Research in Greece that was written by a woman named Lika Katsaikis. If you go to the site, you'll see it right there. And she did a wonderful thing where she uh, created form letters. So she would write the form letter in Greek and then in English, the English translation with <sighs> fill in the blanks. How so cool. you would you, you'd have them side by side and you'd look at the English version and the English version says, my name is blank. So then you write in your name <laughs> and I am looking for a birth record for blank. And then you write in the name of your ancestor. Excuse oh, me. And then you, great. yeah, it's fabulous. That's what I use. That's what I used <laughs> years ago. Um, so here's the thing. The thing is that if, the archive, the municipal archive has something for your family. 
chances are good that you're going to get a response. If the municipal archive does not, and you have to go to the municipal city office where the mayor's office is, and we're talking little towns here, we're talking small little villages, um, then you're at the mercy of the clerks who are trying to take care of everyday business mm -hmm. for the, um, the residents of the area, trying to take care of the needs of the mayor, and their office hours are eight to two. So you're at their mercy <laughs> as to whether they will even respond to your request. Right. Um, wow. To get church records, uh, you would need to write to the priest of the village, and then you would need to know which church in that village your family attended, because as I said earlier, some of these little tiny little villages, they have three or four churches. Yeah. And so with my own personal research in this small village that three of my four grandparents are from, um, two of the families went to one church and one family went to a different church. And I got the records for the one family, but the church that the other two families went to, well, their records have disappeared oh. and they don't start until 1950. Uh. So I'm out of luck. So it's very, um, it, you just don't know what you're gonna get. We, uh, I listened to um, uh, Dear Myrtle and I talk, I listened to people who go back to England to 1600s and, <laughs> exactly. and even my husband's Czech family has, you know, they were little farming people in these little Czech communities. Catholic church records go back to the late 1600s in their little villages. And I'm just green with them because exactly. we just don't have that. Exactly. Laura's got a question. Mm -hmm. So Carol, is genealogy popular in Greece? Is that part of the reason that there hasn't been a, like a local demand for things to be digitized? Um, genealogy, the way we know it, no. Uh, it's not popular in Greece. And at first I couldn't understand it. But when I went, and I have cousins there, and so getting to revisit and meet them and spend, I, I finish work and I go to my cousin's house and we just hang out. Um, and what I learned after being there so many summers is that there's a whole different mindset. Um, people who remain in their villages, and by the way, even if you live in the city, you still have your house in the village. You never give up your house in the village. That is your home. That's where you're from. And uh, so consequently, people are living their history. They're, they are in the home that their great or great great grandfather built in the early 1800s after the Greek Revolution and the Turks left was when a lot of the, the, the current uh, country began to be developed. And so like my cousins live in a house that their great grandfather built. I mean, it's not the same house because they built onto it and they've modernized it and you walk into it and it's beautiful, but the foundation has been there since the early 1800s. So they don't feel a need for genealogy because they are living their history. Now they may not know their aunts, they may not know the names of their great grandparents or great great grandparents, but when you're living in the area that your family's from, that's enough for you. You, yeah, you are, sense. that's who you are. Uh -huh. So it's a different take. Then you have, the so you have that sense of identity mm -hmm. already yeah. that you're not, you're not searching for that sense of identity that a lot of us find through finding out who our ancestors are, or where we came from. Absolutely. So you want to hear the funniest thing of all? One of my, one of my cousins, um, when I go to there, when I go to his house and uh, he's, he's a little bit older now, he's in his mid eighties, but he's just, a, he's just an awesome guy. And he'll say, so Hariklia calls me my Greek name. He's telling me in Greek, so Hariklia, what are you doing tomorrow? And I'm like, tomorrow I'm going to go to the archives and I'm going to look for our family for this and this book and that book. And he says, and he goes like this, he goes, wonderful, come back and tell me what you found. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking, okay, I have to come across an ocean to do this research. And you live down the street. But, you know, <laughs> like, and you want me to come back and tell you what I have found. Um, and it's not that they're, it's not that they don't care or it's not that they're lazy. It's just that it's a different mindset and they it don't have It makes sense mindset. though. It really makes sense because most of the time when we start looking at it, it's because of that desire to know where we came from. 
right to find our to find our people mm -hmm. but if you already pretty much know that mm -hmm. <laughs> you know the desire is not there unless you sure. just want to start collecting names because i'm sure stories have been passed down and and all that kind of thing too so but then it has to be a much more popular i mean just from the size of your groups it has to be much more popular for people of greek ancestry here in the usa the us canada and australia that's where all the migration was those three those three areas so okay yes. but you focused when you first went your scanning you you focused in sparta because that's where you kind of started so can other people follow your model and Boy, that would be so wonderful so but here's mm -hmm. the thing you know do you know the word xenophobia xenophobia yes. is a greek word and the greek uh, root of it is xenos which is a foreigner or an outsider uh. so the greeks are a little xenophobic <laughs> um first if i did not know greg there is no way no way that i could walk into a village or walk into an archdiocese or metropolis office and digitize it's um you you kind of have to and if i wasn't greek american it wouldn't happen you 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 have to be part of you have to know somebody who knows the system or who has i don't want to use the word contacts because that's so business sounding but let's just say network mm -hmm. somebody who is greek like greg can he can contact a, a priest in fact he's in the process right now in the process right now of contacting several other bishops to get permission to do work for them um but he's greek he's from there he's not external he's he's not an outsider and so if the opportunity for him to go in and do that is so much more positive than let's say any one of us who didn't have a contact there to go in and do it but can people individual people start i think so i think what it's what it started with with me was just my own personal research and my desire to go back to where my grandparents came from and find out whatever i could about their families so when you have and i think you all know this as genealogists when you've got a personal interest in something that's where your passion comes in and that's where the fire comes i mean i think about what bernice has done incredible work which she yes. has done for her family and it's all come from a personal desire to know mm -hmm. and to honor those people so um people who who are a greek american or, or greek canadian who want to go back to their their villages their areas if their family there or people that they know there if they can cultivate and and nurture that relationship um they can get introduced to the mayor to the priest to whoever and perhaps after a visit or two there could be some opportunities for them to go in and when they when people see your desire and they mm -hmm. see that you're not coming because you want land or you want to claim an inheritance yeah. or your great grandmother had an olive grove and now you decide that maybe you want it for your family you have to get through all of those all of those um possible barriers and people have to understand that you are you are there because you care well, and because i, I would hope i would hope uh, carol somebody watching this might get inspired you know to to do what you wouldn't so, that be wonderful yes it would be wonderful <laughs> to have just grassroots from yeah. people because if you're from if you're from athens or you're from northern greece or something you know that's important to you now it's important to to greg it's important to my heritage it's important for me i'll go over there i'll go anywhere and spend a couple of months and digitize because wow. i see how critically important it is and i see the need there's just such a great need mm -hmm. um but an average person may not right. have that that desire they would want to go to where they're from and that's perfectly understandable mm -hmm. so hopefully they will be able to go and they will be able to um make some contacts in the archives and mm -hmm. and in other places where perhaps they can set up a digitization project we can help them exactly. i mean I this is what say, we do maybe, maybe somebody can contact you and they can get a hold of greg and then get another grassroots thing going someplace else that would be wonderful absolutely does anybody else have any questions because after your questions i am going to ask carol if she would just give some tips to somebody who 
is starting out um, researching their Greek ancestors and, and don't really know where to even start. So anybody got a question before we do that? Are we all, are we good. all good? All right. Okay, Carol. So okay. I find out that I've got Greek ancestors. What do I do? <laughs> okay. The first thing that you need to do, and nobody wants to hear this, but I have to say it anyway, is you have to find every single document that could possibly have been created for them here mm. in the U.S. or in Canada, if you're in Canada, or in Australia, if you're in Australia, because you have to know, you absolutely have to know exactly the village that they came from, and you have to know the original name. And when you stop and think that somebody like George Stephanopoulos has kept his name and we can all say it, <laughs> but if I tell you that my mother's name was Papayanakos, that will just throw you for a loop. Right. And so it threw the Americans um, in the 19, early 1900s when my grandfather came over the same way. So he changed it to Pappas. Mm. But the records in Greece are not going to be Pappas, they're going to be Papayanakos. So you have mm -hmm. to know that name and you have to know where they're from. So in order to determine that, you have to access and find any documents that could possibly have been created here because and I have alien registration files to prove this, because your ancestors gave different information to different people at different times. <laughs> I have oh, yeah. an alien registration That's just not record. Greek ancestors. No, no, no. That's... <laughs> Let me tell you, I have a grand aunt who gave on her alien registration forms four different surnames. And she was known by all four of them. It's just when you asked her that question on that form, you know, whoever asked her, she gave one name. Then she went back for, I mean, her, her, her AR file is, is 48 pages. And every document on that file has different information. Oh my so gosh. you have to find them all. And then you have to correlate the information to find out what is the village and what really was, was the name. So once you have that, then the other thing to do is uh, you need to make sure that that information correlates with the brothers and sisters of your ancestor. Um, I have a friend who um, does a great job with social security applications of her uh, grandparents and their brothers. And she, we, I've, she gave me her presentation. It's phenomenal because each of those boys, and there are four of them, filled out the information differently on their social security application, their card, uh, the original they, they filled out. <laughs> so you have to do, you have to get it all. Okay, so once you know that, then you can get online. You can join our Facebook page, um, Hellenic uh, Genealogy Geek on Facebook. And we'll and have that say, link in our, we'll have that link. For yeah, and we can, and you can say, hey, this is my family. This is the village that they're from. They came to the U.S. Um, my grandfather had a meat market in Chicago. Does anybody know this name? So as wow. soon as you post the name and the area, then it's amazing to see what happens. People come out of the woodwork. Yeah. And we have seen posts where people have said, oh, um, yeah, uh, my aunt lives in that village. I'll have her ask for you if oh the family's still gosh. there. It's amazing. It's just wow. amazing. So that's the first thing, the surname, the village, get online at um, Hellenic Genealogy Geek, go to the Family Search Wiki under Greece. We've been working really hard with the Wiki coordinators for that page. It's beautifully done. There are tons of resources there. Um, you can contact Gregory at GreekAncestry.net. Gregory does free consultations, um, half hour consultations wow. for free for anybody um, and he will help you figure out where you are, what you know, and what could possibly be available for you mm -hmm. um, in Greek records. Wow. So there so is then you would there. take Then you would take a trip to Greece. Then you would Hello. take a trip to Greece and go. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So that's, that's the way you get started. That's the way you get started. <laughs> that's wonderful. And you know, a lot of those tips apply to other foreign countries too. So not yeah. just, not, you know, just, going to you know having greek ancestors you know mm -hmm. you've got to figure out where they were from and if there were name changes so that applies to so many different countries so that's those absolutely are good tips. those are good tips 
the other point, the other thing I'd like to bring out is my friend Georgia, who started Hellenic Genealogy Geek, excuse me, the Facebook page. She also has a website, hellenicgenealogygeek.blogspot.com. Okay. She is amazing. She is a voracious reader. She is out on that web every day looking for information, for links, for resources. She puts them up on her on her blog. She has a document now um, that is um, Greek resources. She has it by category and uh, it's links to online places where you can get information about either a certain village, oh, maybe wow. even if you're an adoptee, she has a whole section on adoptees, hmm. um, people whose families were from Asia Minor who were expelled in 1920 during a terrible Holocaust, um, uh, just a terrible, terrible, and we use the word Holocaust because it was a Holocaust, um, expelled from what is now Turkey, um, and uh, there's just, she's just done a fabulous job. So once you get connected in our community, you're going to find, you're going to find amazing things happen. People will work with you and help you. Um, that is wonderful. And we will, have, very we will have all these links in the blog post and on the, and on YouTube as well, so that people can find everything. So Perfect. that is just wonderful. Carol, thank you so much. Before we end, I just want to give anybody any last chance if they had anything they wanted to ask or say or comment. I just on. think, Carol, I just think you're an inspiration. Oh, just... me too. Oh, thank you. It's, um, it, you know what, we're, we're all inspired by what moves us and what moves us is our love for, for, for this work and honestly to honor our ancestors. That's what it's all about. Um, we want to make sure that they're never forgotten. We want to make sure that our children and grandchildren and people way after them understand who they were. Mm -hmm. These were brave people. These people got on a boat, not knowing a word of English. They went to a strange country. They worked like crazy. Um, somebody like my grandfather started off selling apples on a push cart, made enough money to get a little hot dog stand on Coney Island, went from there to open restaurants. He wound up, when he died, he had property all over New York. I mean, they lived, the, they were the American dream. Mm. And we kind of take for granted our life. I think this COVID thing has kind of made all of us sit up and, and rethink the things we took for granted. But the people who came before us, no matter who they were or what country they came from, when they came here, they were brave. And mm -hmm. they did, they gave up everything in their old life so that they could have a better life for us. And at the least we can do is find them and memorialize them and make sure that they're never forgotten. Mm, very well said. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. Thank you much. so much for having me on. It was wonderful to see all your faces. I miss <laughs> you all so much. Uh, it was great. It was great to have you. And like I said, if, if just one person could be inspired to start some kind of program like this, whether it's in, in, in Greece or anywhere else. Anywhere, that's Anywhere, right. you know, get out there and, and do something and, and get records out. I think that's a wonderful message to leave with tonight. Can I, can I ask a question of Melissa? Of course you Melissa, can. Melissa, as an archivist and somebody who is one of your biggest fans, <laughs> do you have any advice as to, as to what people can do or, or guide a guideline for somebody maybe who might be listening to this or even for me personally. Um, I would just love to know your thoughts. Um, about digitization? About record preservation. Oh, record preservation. Anything. Well, mm -hmm. first and foremost, do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, I've been very encouraged actually during this time that we've had to be at our homes that people even maybe reluctantly have been cleaning out their closets and underneath their beds and things like that. And, um, and I've noticed that a lot of genealogists are looking at their records in a different way because they're taking the time to do that. And I've been getting a tremendous amount of questions about how to take care of this, how to take care of that. Uh, first and foremost is that you don't do anything to anything that you can't undo. Oh, wow, that's a, um, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and, and I get a lot of questions about, do I have to use archival materials 
such as our archival uh, file folders, archival boxes, all this, because it's so much more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and I come from the school of, if you can afford it, yes. Mm -hmm. If you can't afford it, get the plain old file folders, get the plain old page protectors, and get your documents and stuff in them, because those will at least be protected from the elements and from other mm -hmm. things. And then as you can, you know, change it out. Baby and if you steps, can't, yeah. you can't. The main thing is, no matter what you put your records in, it, wherever you store them is the most important. Temperature and humidity are our enemy. Mm -hmm. And if you keep your temperatures and humidities at a consistent level, whether that's 55 degrees, whether that's 65 degrees, whether the humidity is at 35 or 45, the consistency is, is the, the difference because our records are deteriorating whether we do anything with them or not. Mm -hmm. And so if we can get them in uh, protective materials and keep them at a, you know, a steady temperature and humidity levels, we stand a better chance of our records being preserved and digitize them. Scan your records, get them digitized. Yeah. Get those digitizations out of your home and into the hands of other family members or other places in case, God forbid, something happens to your home. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is I encourage people to donate. Mm -hmm. Donate your records while you're living. I know it's hard for a lot of people, but try to come to grips of maybe going ahead and doing that because we all have children or grandchildren or descendants that are not going to care about this stuff. That's right. That's right. I have people walk in. I, I tell the story all the time, so people have probably have heard it a gazillion times, but a couple of years ago, I had two sisters walk into the archives. They had two big boxes full of three ring binders. And those serving binders were the 50 years worth of their mother's genealogy research, and they were on the way to the dump to throw them away. Oh, and so, and, and that really, I already had it in my mind. I already knew that we needed to, but then when that happens, I really have been on, I kind of kicked into the high gear about telling people to donate, mm -hmm. make provisions of where your records could go. Right, mm -hmm. right. All right, that's, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful way to end. Either, <laughs> you know, Find a big, find a big um, project like Carol's been doing, and if you can't or don't have time or, or the finances or whatever, make sure your own things are archived. Make sure you have your own family archive because that's just, that's just as important is to make sure those records are saved because those generations coming after you are going to hopefully maybe want to, to look at them. And if they don't, at least they're in a place to, so eventually somewhere down the line, <laughs> somebody's going to be able to say, hey, great, great grandma did this and I know where to find it. So yeah. with that, thank you everybody for coming and joining us on the panel. It was so good to talk to you, Carol. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. There's a thank lot of inspiration Carol. in that. So <laughs> thank, thank you so you. much. And we will see you next time on Gen Friends. Bye, everybody.